Hello, I think we're ready to get started. It's 11 o'clock on the dot. I know some people come in just a little bit late, but we like to make sure that we get started on time and allow for the presentation and any questions. So welcome to this week's Purdue at Westgate webinar series. My name is Samantha Nelson, and I'm the program manager for the Purdue Foundry at Westgate. Today, we'd like to introduce you to a new webinar series that we're going to be promoting. We're calling it Defense in Indiana. We are very proud to say that just within our small area within the Westgate at Crane Tech Park, there are over 64 plus companies, with the majority of them being defense contractors that support the Crane Naval Support Center. Purdue at Westgate strives to be that regional hub of connection and support to these companies. The intention is to highlight the defense contractors within our region and state to help promote their technology and capabilities to startups or small businesses that would have interest in potentially collaborating with them, as well as to help introduce new talent or future employees from universities or currently employed. Today's webinar, Counter UAS Systems Development Challenges and Opportunities, will be presented by Vinnie Watson. Vinnie is a Senior Business Development Executive with CACI. If you aren't familiar with CACI, they are an American multinational professional services and informational technology company headquartered in Arlington, Virginia. They provide services to many branches of the U.S. federal government, including defense, homeland security, intelligence, and healthcare. We're excited to have a satellite office of CACI within the Westgate at Crane Te Technology Park supporting the Naval Support Weapons Center at Crane. We ask that you please mute your microphones and you can choose whether you'd like to show your video or not during the presentation. If you should have a question, please utilize the chat function at the bottom of your screen and Vinny will answer questions directly after the presentation. The recording of this presentation and the actual presentation will be sent to you when the webinar is completed. So without further ado, let's please welcome Vinny Watson. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. And I wanna give say a big thank you to Purdue Foundry, Foundry and everybody here. here thank, you, thank you for coming, coming. I've worked with a lot of Purdue graduates over the past 20 years or so, and every single one of them have, have just been fantastic people. Even one of my old, uh, old Naval Postgraduate School friends that I see is Dal, Dal Danny here. He's a fantastic man doing great work for the Army. I'm not gonna embarrass him by saying his name. Say his name. The leader of our, uh, our sector is actually a Purdue graduate right now here at CACI, Mr. Todd Prober. Today, I'm going to be discussing counter UAS as from the perspective of a small business. How can a small business enter the counter UAS field and make, and make some money, money working with either the government or defense? That participation and feedback from prior such speaking engagements tells me that the most value we're going to get out of these things is in the, in the Q&A in some cases. So I'm definitely going to, going to leave some, uh, Q, some time for Q&A at the end of this presentation. Now, there's a myth in some circles, and it is a myth that uh, products in defense for small businesses don't really sink. I'm here to tell you that is a false. That's a, fa that's a falsehood. It is absolutely not, tr not true. Defense, both the industry and the DOD itself, need small businesses. We need the innovation they bring to the table. We also, also need, need them to, in, to engage with us and bring the agility that only they, they can offer they can offer us so we can pace dynamic and, and important adversaries right now. I want you to walk away with a couple things here. One is that government and the people in the industry want to engage, engage with you. And two, there is opportunity here if you want to, want to engage and push your small business in that direction. I'm gonna reinforce that over the, over the course of this presentation. When we talk here, I'm going to take a defense-centric approach here for a couple reasons. First of all, I have a defense background, so it's easier for me to do. Second of all, I think that's the best way to approach the counter UAS problem set, set given its nature. There are significant non-defense counter UAS opportunities with Department of Homeland Security, FAA, Department of Justice, and other government entities, but all of those organizations are going to leverage work that is being done in defense, and I'll cover some of those requirements too towards the end. We're going to begin with a little information about drones. I'm then going to speak about aerial drones in particular, that is why we're here, how they've evolved in their uses today. Because UAS are airborne assets and anti-air warfare is a well-established and well-practiced area of war warfare. I'm gonna talk about that and its evolution. Lucian, then I'm gonna talk about, about a few key takeaways uh, based upon that on how you can do business with DOD. 
I'm then going to go over a lot about countering UAS, how that has evolved as an art form, and then go into some of the areas that pose challenges and opportunities that could be of interest to small business. I'm going to close by spending a few minutes on how small businesses can engage with both government and industry to meet, meet those challenges and offer a few lessons learned from my time working on both the small and the large business side of the house. As we get going, I want to say this about small businesses and startups when it comes to the defense industry. Not all defense opportunities are hundreds of millions of dollars that only large contractors can bid, not by any means. The defense industry and Department of Defense both need and want to work with you. So do other areas of government, I guarantee it. I've been, uh, who is this Vinny Watson character and why should you listen to me about drones? I've been working with and looking at drones and the problems they pose since about 1997 when I deployed with a drone, a remote minesweeping prototype on an old Spruance class destroyer. Or, now, this remote minesweeping device was pretty, was pretty cool. As I learned more and more about it throughout the course of the deployment, I thought about the possibilities for using drones for other purposes, offensive and defensive, beyond minesweeping. A few years later, I was on the floor of a dry dock, uh, put a much more modern destroyer on the, on the blocks, and a jet skier happened to slip by the security patrol just to come take a look at us. It wasn't a good day for the security force. As I waved at the guy, I, I, for some odd reason, that minesweeping device popped into my mind, and I said, you know, it was a lot easier for me to see that jet ski approaching than it was for me to monitor the remote minesweeping device from the bridge of that destroyer. That is a really good way to collect intelligence on adversaries. A few months later, drones came further into my view. I took the reins as the officer in charge at the Space and Naval Warfare Command out in the, out in the Middle East. Iranian drone threats became key and critical and was definitely on my mind back then, let me tell you. A short while later, I took the reins of a major signals intelligence program program and let's just say that we looked at drones i'll leave it there after leaving the navy i immediately went to work as the technical director for a venture capital portfolio up in the bay area silicon valley that not only was that a ton of fun that exposed me to startups how they operate operate all manners of funding from vc betting to angel funding funding how they do how they do business some of the mistakes they made they made made funding rounds mergers and acquisitions you name it for about the past three years, I've had counter UAS in my electronic warfare portfolio here at CACI. I'm gonna tell you, I engage with the DOD regularly. These guys are deadly serious about countering this threat. They have stood up a new command and placed a two-star general in charge of a joint organization just to address this threat and to coordinate efforts across all the services. That's a significant investment on their part. The DOD wants results. They don't care if it comes from uh, Samantha Nelson. They don't care if it comes from Purdue. They don't care if it comes from CACI. They don't care if it comes from my wife. They don't care if it comes from you. They want what works and they wanna get it there in a coordinated manner and keep the warfighters and all of us safe. Now, with that, uh, let's talk about some drones. Uh, Sam, am I sharing, do we have my presentation up yet? No, it is not. Okay, it, it tells me I can't share. It doesn't like me now. Can you make me a presenter again? I thought I did. There you go. Maybe. Okay. I thought you get, I thought you became embarrassed of me. Okay. <laughs> I apologize. I thought I made you co-host. Oh, that, that's okay. Most people are embarrassed once they get to know me. <laughs> All right. Hey, folks, let's talk about some drones. What you see here is the first drone that was ever invented back in the 1890s. Tesla, and if you're an engineer on here, I hope you like Tesla, you should. He's one of the greatest engineers that ever lived. Tesla, the Tesla, built this thing on the, on the left here. It was a remote controlled service vessel back in the 1890s. I got this off a website devoted to him and he even got a patent on this. You can see his patent number on there and I am enough of a geek where I actually looked it up on the US Patent and Trademark Office. You can find it on there. there. Tesla tried to sell this to the American Navy and uh, they turned him down. Other navies were paying attention though. As a matter of fact, the Germans had tethered drones for uh, port defense in World War I. And if you look in the center of the screen here, you'll see a small boat here. It looks kind of strange. It has DCB-1 on the side. This picture comes from the UK National Historic Ship Register and it shows a boat just like one that sank a German destroyer off the coast of Belgium in World War I. I want you to let that sink in for a second. Now, if you follow the news in the past five or six years, I know, or at least I hope you might remember if you follow defense news, 
that a certain country was using remote control boats to target American warships. Think about that. Smart fellow, Mr. Tesla. Now, how many drones are in the U.S. Navy surface fleet today? When did they get there? Is that the speed of innovation we want or need to see to pace a dynamic adversary like UAS? I want you to really think about, think about that, and that's a point I'm going to drive home. Drones are not just for ground to surface operations. You see a pretty cool one up here to the right, right? That's a Fordham's drone hunter. Now, in World War I, aerial drones were attempted, but some, let's say, lack of judgment and test procedures in a couple of cases caused them to not become overly popular. That wasn't the case in World War II. Over 15,000 radio, radio plans were made for the U.S. Army during World, World War II, and interest in remote-controlled aircraft continued unabated after it came to a close. In fact, in Vietnam, the Fire Bees remote, remote aircraft flew thousands of ISR missions, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. I'm going to use that term fairly often here in this presentation, ISR. If you're going to talk drones, that's something you need to understand. Now, post-World War II, the remote control model aircraft industry came to fruition, and it, that has done nothing but flourish over the, over the past few years. It's still going on today. You can actually go online and find some fairly cool World War II uh, replicas and, and fly them yourself. You can even get them with first-person video. You have these goggles that you, you can put on. But let me warn you, if you actually try and go buy these things, I might have crashed one, two, a few of these things. It's not as easy as it looks to fly these things. And make sure, if you do so, make sure you're safe and uh, is safe and to obey all the laws and regulations. UAS industry just isn't about models. If you follow defense acquisition, you should know that there are many, many unmanned vessels, vehicles, aircraft, underwater vehicles that are soon gonna become weapons of war and a lot are already out there. I'd like to reflect on just a few things here. First of all, think of all the advances that had to happen to get from Mr. Tesla to that quadcopter over there on the right and some of the more advanced ones that DOD is gonna produce. Did large companies come up with every one of those innovations? I assure you they didn't. As a small business community, I also want you to think about this fact. DOD is investing in you in unmanned vehicles. They're not investing to the tune of millions. They are investing in to the tune of billions. The Navy has stated that over 35% of its future fleet could be unmanned surface vessels. Navy has a surface development squadron one right now that has unmanned surface vessels under, under its command and they're developing concept, concepts of employment for them today. Every service has unmanned aerial system efforts underway and in operation. And many of these are large multi-year development programs intended for far more than ISR missions. Now, why am I saying this here to small businesses? I shall tell you, DOD has requirements for small businesses to participate in its large contracts. There's an opportunity I'm working on today that it's over a billion dollars and over 25% of that is mandated to go to small businesses. Now, I'm going to talk about how small business can engage later, but I wanted to drive that point home right here for you right now to help dispel that myth. DOD and the defense industry need you. Now, let's move on to modern UAS and how they evolved a little bit. Modern UAS over the past 10 years have just evolved dramatically. It, it's a dynamic market. They were able to leverage years of work by the remote control model aircraft industry, as well as advantages and feedback from a rapidly increasing base of users to bring, bring, bring to the table from an innovation perspective. The more feedback you get, more minds are better than one. A lot of minds are better than, than a few. The feedback they've been able to get has driven innovation. With a user base that's over 70% by some estimates and over 90% by others, a Chinese company called DJI has helped drive a lot of that innovation. You see one of their quadcopters here towards the center. They're not the only player in the game, though. And if you follow drones and drone, drone news, you, I have no doubt you realize the U.S. government wants American drone companies in this game. They want them in, their, in the game for myriad reasons. And the U.S. drone industry has responded with small businesses leading the way in many regards. And you can see some of the products here. On the left, you see one of our fine CACI ladies doing a hand launch of a fixed wing drone. Fixed wing drones dominated the market for some, some time, and they're still doing great work today. The, the Leap drone out of SOCOM, as well as the Puma that the Army and Marine Corps are using are great examples. The cool guy in the suit here is one Mr. Daryl Annunciato from Action Drones in uh, Chula Vista, California. He's a leader in the San Diego drone community. And I got to tell you, the San Diego drone community is doing a lot of good work to advance the art form of drones. Now, I didn't put this uh, picture in here just to give Daryl a good time. That's just a, a side effect that, that's pleasing. 
uh, pleasing. I put this in here. One, he gave me uh, permission to do it. And two, I want you to take a look at that Pelican case that he's carrying. And think on this. Think about the fact that a powerful ISR tool that can provide ISR and targeting data suitable for mortar and artillery fires to target our troops is commercially available and can be carried in that, in that Pelican case. UAS, just like the ones you see flying on either side of Daryl. Think about that. Let that sink in. If you let that sink in, I think you'll understand why it's so vital to the Department of Defense to counter this threat. And I'm gonna tell you, DOD does not care if you have a good idea that can help keep warfighters safe, Major General Sean Ganey and the, and the Joint Capability Office for UAS, any DOD person, if it can help keep warfighters safe and make us more effective, or them more effective, I'm retired, but the, I, I, I have assimilated, they wanna talk to you and they're gonna find a way to help make you successful in getting to them. Now, UAS propulsion is evolving, evolving as, well, as well. Take a, take a look in the lower right-hand corner. You, you see a, a hybrid fixed wing and, and vertical takeoff system. A company called Census is developing also out there in California. They're being used for actually drone-on-drone -drone combat as well. In the upper side of the screen, you'll see Fordham with their drone, uh, drone net capture method. They're in, they're in action. Now, as an aside that should be of interest, and that's part of the reason I put the Fordham guys on this slide, Shortly after completing their Series B funding round, Fordham was acquired by Toshiba. Now, control of aerial drones is also evolving. I want to spend just a short time talking about that, about that here. here. Right now, today, as compared to just a few years ago with the remote control model, uh, model aircraft industry, you can get first-person videos streamed over orthogonal frequency division multiplexed radio frequency controlled by a frequency hopping spread spectrum signal. Companies are also leveraging advances in software-defined radios to drive improvements at the speed of software. That's not amateur hour by any means in the world of RF engineering. Payloads for UAS have advanced alongside the UAS themselves and advances in digital photography, photogrammetry, and optics have turned them into powerful ISR tools. Unfortunately, they're being employed by not only friendlies, but uh, terrorists and state actors alike. Companies and state and terrorists have put missiles, guns, and bombs on UAS, yes, and they've employed them. Some companies are automating drones with imagery-based automated algorithms for guidance, navigation, and avoidance purposes. They're leveraging advances in processing to enable convolutional neural network networks to do advanced imagery processing right there on these aircraft. They've also incorporated integral control to augment more traditional PD controls controls into small form factors. About 10 years ago, if you'd asked many, even engineers in the field, they would have told you this is impossible. Hey, guess what? It's here today. Now, think again. Did small companies help out there? Did they make any of that technology? Did they bring them to the forefront? Oh, absolutely they did. What's going to be next? And I, next, I don't know. Many of you might, but I guarantee you that small businesses are going to be involved in it and advancing this art form further. Let's talk about the uh, Aviation warfare, UAS or aviation assets, and so are they going to be employed as an aircraft would in many, many cases, ISR. Now, so let, if you're going to talk about uh, aircraft, taking a look at aviation warfare is a wise thing to do. Man flight commenced with balloons, and right away they were used for ISR missions, including in the Union Army's uh, Balloon Corps or in the American Civil War. Army, anybody that says the Army doesn't innovate, doesn't know the Army, believe me, they do. Uh, power, powered aviation came into the picture and then airships and biplanes brought aviation to a real warfare area and started to refine the art form in World War I. Biplanes started out with ISR missions in the early stages of the war, and by the end of the war, they were doing air-to-air -air combat. Uh, if you're familiar with a guy called the Red Baron, that's, that's when he was. These advances continued into World War II. Parachutes enabled aerial insertion of ground forces as never before, and airborne infantry became a critical component of land warfare. Better engines enabled more maneuvers for pilots to carry out air-to-air -air combat and extend ranges for bombing missions. missions. Propulsion innovation continues today in many regards, as does innovation in every aspect of aviation warfare. And I'm here to tell you, small businesses are involved. Pictured here is a tribute to my naval heritage, and I like this picture when talking about aviation warfare because you really can see a lot of things. You see jets, turboprops, helicopters, air search radars, communication systems, all clear components of a aviation warfare fair today. Even my very studious uh, Air Force friend from Georgia Tech would have to admit the aircraft carrier and its ability to project power is one of the greatest achievements in aviation history. Now, 
advances in sensors, materials, propulsion, modeling, computer processing, countless other fields went in to drive our current state of play. Where many and now many defense experts are calling about automated combat drones to do drone on drone combat and drone versus man combat. Think about the path from Kitty Hawk today and did small business play a part in that? Oh yeah, when you save small businesses in defense, that is a myth. There is room for you in this, in this ball game. What's gonna be next? Some of the people on this call might be involved in it. Now, if you, when you have an area of warfare, I guarantee you people are gonna say, how do I counter this? Counter this. So let's talk a little bit about anti-air warfare. There's a couple things I'd like to drive, drive home here. The current head of, head of Department of Defense's Joint Capabilities Office for Counter UAS has an air defense background. So if you're gonna talk about Counter UAS, how do you think he's going to be thinking from a customer's perspective? I guarantee you he's thinking as an air defense guy. That's in his, that's in his DNA. Now, what you see here is a very simplified version, and I do mean it, it has been simplified, of the Army's integrated air and ballistic missile defense architecture that was published in Breaking Defense a few months ago. What you see down here on the right, right is a picture of an Aegis destroyer, and the Aegis weapon system, system is the pinnacle of Navy, Navy anti-air warfare. It's installed on all our modern destroyers and cruisers. These are systems of systems with multiple programs of records contained within them. Every program of record is going to be a large development mental defense contract, or at least the vast majority of them will be, that has small business contracting requirements. Hmm, every single one of them. These systems are the pinnacle of evolution of decades of hard learned lessons in aviation warfare. They manage the de initial detection of an airborne object, identify it, track it, then engage it if considered hostile and the rules of engagement allow, and they provide what's called a layered defense via a system of systems for multiple vendors. Think about how this evolved. The sensing evolved from visual to audio, to radar, to sense these, these threats. Firearms and machine guns targeted aircraft, and then those became larger caliber anti-aircraft batteries, ground-based, based, sea-based, and even mobile. Air aircraft missions evolved from ISR only to air-to-air -to -air combat and bombing missions, and kinetic munitions evolved from mere bullets into ship and ground-fired anti-air missiles, air-to-ground missiles, and those evolved, evolved into air-to-air -air missiles as well as, as technology advanced even further. Command and control is key and critical when dealing with multi systems, systems of systems. It's absolutely key, key and critical, critical. And you can't have a layered defense in, in depth without that command and control. A few takeaways from both ground and maritime perspectives here. Layered defenses are required for UAS for, for many, many reasons. reasons. It's also required for anti-air war, warfare like we're discussing here. A multi-sensor, multi-effector open architecture that's gonna enable systems from multiple vendors because no one vendor has it all it is required. It's in existence today. Take a, look, take a look at these two things. You think one company built all those? You're out of your mind. Right. Now that open architecture that's required in order to make, make third-party integration fairly easy is a difficult thing to do. And believe me, that's on, that's on the DOD's mind as we're talking, to, talking about counter UAS. They are not gonna fall into that trap. Another key takeaway here for small businesses is if you're gonna do business with DOD, you, you need to understand your customer base here. You're gonna bring a product that is not gonna operate in isolation. It is gonna operate with, within a system of systems, much like the one you see, see up here to the left. Some people might call this an operational view and might even dub it an OB1 of sorts based on, a, based on some, some things I don't wanna get into here. It doesn't matter what domain you're gonna operate, operate in. If you're gonna operate in air, space, cyber, maritime, or ground, DOD is going to have multiple systems already in existence, and they're not going to say, hey, your product is the best. I'm going to scrap all those systems inst instantaneously and uh, bring yours in. No, you're going to field and they're going to maximize the return on taxpayer investment for those products unless it's totally obsolete and of no use to them. I guarantee it. You need to be able to tell them how your product will fit into the environment that they currently know and operate in if you're going to be effective in marketing with DOD. Now, I want to drive my uh, point home again. I sound like a broken record, but I don't like this myth. Did small businesses contribute to any of this? I'm not going to say the answer. I hope you know it at this point. Let's talk about how counter UAS evolved as well. Like UAS themselves, uh, counter UAS is a dynamic ballgame. It really is. And over the past decade, it has evolved drastically. As a UAS emerged as a threat and became used by state and non-state adversaries alike, you know, oh, warfighters did what they're trained to do. They, they treated this as an aviation warfare problem, and they had some major issues. 
DOD was able to help them meet, the, meet these challenges by leveraging its base of contractors with extensive knowledge of radio frequency exploitation. And CACI was among them. We among them, we're proud to say, us and several others, I'm not making a marketing pitch here. It was initially a stationary defense problem, but as these UAS became more and more common, it quickly evolved, just as aviation warfare did, into a mobile defense pro problem, as our adversaries used drones to for ISR missions to target forces in transit and at sea. The need for manned portable solutions drove a manned portable variant for RF-based defense and detection. And in the skies today, you'll even find these, these aboard UAS, uh, as you see in the upper right-hand hand corner here. Did aviation warfare evolve in the same way? I think you'll find we've got stationary, mobile, and manned portable Raytheon Stinger missile anti-air warfare assets, assets, and you see anti-air warfare assets in the air as well, just like aviation warfare evolved, counter UAS evolved as well. And the well, in the lower right-hand corner here, you see you see a, a screenshot of a system called FADC2. That's Forward Area Air Defense Command and Control System. DOD D today is evolving this even, even further. They, even further, they're investing in special munitions, radar improvements for target acquisition and, and improvements on acoustic sensing devices. Large programs of record under PEO missiles in space today have requirements for missile intercept of UAS within them. They're investing in command and control tools and data fusion tools for multi-sensor, multi-effector operations and integration of counter UAS capabilities into existing anti-air warfare command and control systems, like the one I just mentioned and also the Air Force's Medusa. The Joint Capability Office for Counter US is even funding a uh, high level data fusion architecture project. They wanna ensure that data exchange between any asset that's gonna be involved in Counter UAS is going to be seamless and simple. What's gonna be next and will small businesses play a role? I don't think I've got to answer to that question anymore. If I do, I'm missing the mark here, getting my point across. I want to talk about, I've mentioned the words layered defense before, and I want to mention the words layered defense again. It's safe to say that both counter UAS from an anti-air warfare perspective, evolve, both evolve from single sensor, single weapon systems into complex system of systems that deploy, that are employed in a layered defense concept. I want to share a few thoughts here on layered defense to get some synapses firing. And you can see a, a, a layered defense pictured in this diagram here, here. And again, when you come to DOD, you want to bring a diagram like this or one, one of the ones that uh, on the anti-air war warfare so they can see how your, how your product's gonna be employed. Employed, sometimes talking about it's not enough. You really need to be able to illustrate what you're gonna talk about. Sensing the environment to detect a threat uh, and then tracking it to the point where you're gonna do something about that threat is a difficult thing to do with the counter UAS, with the UAS threat. In addition to the fact that UAS, both adversary and blue force alike, are things that US forces in the field are gonna to wanna to track and know where they're at. at. They present a lot of problems. They have what's called a low radar cross section. The smaller the object, the more difficult it can be to detect. Now, radars that operate in the frequency ranges to detect these things have uh, laws of physics limitations in certain atmospheric conditions that are difficult to overcome. They lead to a lot of false, tar false targets. Now, do you want to send a missile or a kinetic round at a false target? Not if you're smart enough to be on this phone call. Now, many other factors also make that a complex problem set. There is no one single silver bullet solution that's going to defeat modern UAS on, on the battlefield. It's got to be a system of systems similar to the well-developed anti-air warfare systems I described earlier. They have to operate in concert and within a larger DOD air domain with other systems of systems. Now, ideally, such a monster is gonna be an integrated, multi-domain, layered network defense comprised of overlapping long, medium, and short-range capabilities with redundancy. I said, ideally, does any plan survive first contact? If you've ever been in the military, you know that is not the case. Uh, I would assume the same in the business world. In my experience, it's absolute true, it's rare. Now, in peer-to-peer -peer conflicts, does anybody expect networks and communications networks to go unchallenged, to stay in place 100% of the time? If so, I personally think you're out of your mind, but uh, you, I, could, I could, be, could be wrong. Wrong. Think on that. What happens if network connectivity is lost in, in a combined system of systems? Can the subcomponents operate independently? Good question. And if you think about it, I think you're gonna, gonna know why it's in, important that, that they be able to operate independently to have at least some effect, even if it is degraded from a network, network overall system of systems. I also think you'll understand why assured communications and network connectivity is valued so heavily by forces in the field today. 
The layered aspect of our counter UAS capabilities are important, especially for wide area coverage because drones are not likely to be employed, employed merely individually, though they certainly will be, especially by non-state actors. I think they're gonna be employed by groups and in, in autonomous swarms in the, in the very near future, and I say they can do so today. It's unlikely one defensive layer is gonna suffice for that. The systems architecture that's put in place is going to have to present the threat with both simultaneous and sequential engagement challenges to reduce their effectiveness and likelihood of success. Layered and mobile capabilities help it maximize protection and cover potential limitations of individual systems and it limits the impact of potential malfunctions of any, any systems or gaps in coverage due to, due to employment. Because UAS threat is dynamic, the system must easily be upgradable to match it. You can't have a library-based system that you can't upgrade easily in the field. You just can't, can't do it. Or if any new capability that's not library-based, which would be ideal, you, you just simply cannot have, have that. This threat is so dynamic that if you can't upgrade easily, you cannot match that. That's key and critical. It's also key and critical, not from a software perspective, but from a hardware perspective as well. Remember when I, I talked about, talked about third-party integration? If somebody has a new innovation and DOD wants to field it to keep soldiers, airmen, and Marines and sailors safe, and I guarantee if that's the case they do, it has to be easily fieldable and upgradable. An open architecture from a hardware and a software and a data perspective is absolutely required, key, and critical. And I guarantee you DOD is looking at that right now. They might even be looking at that up in Indiana. Command and control is key and critical. When you have a system of systems operating that and operating that in concert, concert for an intended purpose is absolutely manda mandatory for it to be effective. The way DOD has approached this is they have defined a couple of architectures, the FADC2 I mentioned earlier and the Air Force's Medusa. If you're going to bring a counter UAS capability in order, to, order for them, if they're going to fund it, it's going to be, be able to be integrated into FADC2 and Medusa. Now, automation of any system of systems, I don't care what it is, to reduce the cognitive load on any operator, and I say minimize that cognitive load, load is key and critical, critical. When you are in a combat situation or when you're under stress, you don't want to look at something that is overly complex where you have to fire multiple synapses or any more synapses than necessary to carry out your mission and have, have the intended effect. In fact, counter UAS is absolutely no different. Along with that, minimizing the time required for training on any counter UAS system or any system DOD fields is key and critical. Time is money. Is money a constraint? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do we as taxpayers payers want the DOD to use our money effectively? Yes. yes. It's key to bring that training time down. You don't want to make it ineffective, but you want to minimize it, not only for operators, but for maintainers of a, of a system. As I said earlier, there's, there's not a silver bullet, and anybody that says there is, is quite frankly, in my opinion, I, out of the gourd. It's going to take a combination of an integrated system of systems approach with the right tactics, techniques, and procedures to increase the probability of success for any counter UAS system. And that's how anti-air warfare evolved. Evolved. I mean, it evolved to its current state today, today and it's, it's extremely effective. Now, this next slide might scare a few people. It is a slide without pictures. I hope nobody in this audience is horrified. I know you're all literate and I cannot stand it when people read slides aloud to me, so I'm not gonna read slides al aloud to you. you. I think it's insulting to your intellect. I hope by this point you realize that there are plenty of opportunities for small business to engage in the counter UAS world. I should also hope you realize that I'm not gonna give away the CACI game book for how we're gonna approach counter UAS any more than I'm gonna make a sales pitch here. There, there is plenty of opportunity. The areas you see here, I pulled from a fairly well-written article that was in the March issue of IEEE's AES magazine by some folks from Embry-Riddle, and they did a decent job of identifying areas of opportunity. I want to talk about a few of them and how the market might drive opportunity for both large and small businesses here. Companies are looking at different propulsion systems to include voice swath and Magnus effect-based propulsion system. Will current acoustic sensors in the field recognize them or will their sound signature require modifications to those systems? Will they require new sensors? Are, can the ones currently employed to be mod modified in any way via software? Will hardware be required? Radio frequency detection, that's been around for, been around for years. Do you have an idea for co-site interference mit mitigation, a way to, minify, to miniaturize RF sensors so that they can be smaller and more man portable? A new antenna design. Do you have an innovation in digital, digital signal processing, maybe? 
If the answer is, answer is yes, there's opportunity for you in the counter UAS world. High energy lasers, a lot of work is going in, into those over time. Time You've seen some great, great articles over time. Raytheon is doing good work, good work there. AFRL, uh, I believe, is still doing some good work. A lot of people are putting a lot of money into high energy lasers, but they don't come without their, out their problems. Do you have a, a thermal management solution to dissipate the heat those things produce so they can get a higher rate of fire? Do you have an innovation in power amplifiers for high, high energy microwaves? Do you have a control innovation that can improve the art of drone on drone aerial combat? If so, there's money in counter UAS for you to be made. These are just a few questions that come to mind. And, and if you can think of anything that might help in any of these, any of these fields, I guarantee you the companies currently working on counter UAS would like to talk with you about your innovation and DOD would like to talk with you about, about your innovation. I, gar I guarantee it. I wanna draw your attention to the lower left-hand bullet uh, on the screen, unmanned traffic management. Now I said earlier that uh, DOD is not the only game in town when it comes to counter UAS, and that's a correct statement. Many other US government agencies are taking a look at the counter UAS problem because it's key and critical to keeping us safe both at home and abroad. Domestic agencies have a huge role in counter UAS. Are they gonna leverage some of the work that's being done today in DOD? Absolutely. Now, do they have their own unique requirements? Absolutely. I want to talk about a few of those requirements here. Here, if you're going to, if you're into UAS and flying them legally, I hope you understand what Lance is. That's the FAA, FAA way that they're saying you get a mother may I to, to operate your drone, especially key and critical if you decide to operate near an, near an airfield. You do not want to get in trouble with the FAA operating a drone. It's not going to be a good day for you. Now, FAA also has a, a new regulation called Remote ID. D for UAS goes into effect uh, fairly soon, actually. Now, will there be opportunity for that to make some profit for any company that has RF? Absolutely, you, you know there is, software as well. Well, minimizing foreign object damage from counter, from mitigating U, a UAS is gonna be key and critical for the, critical in an FAA environment. You do not want to crash a UAS on an airstrip and then then take time away from that airstrip, that air, airstrip or, or runways being in used to clear away the foreign foreign objects that objects there foreign objects and turbines are a bad thing bad thing i want you to think about the uas that shut down gatwick airport for a while and if you've ever flown into gatwick or heathrow you know there's a lot of planes in the air i want you to think about the economic impact impact of that and that's going to tell you how serious the faa is about keeping its its runways free and clear and keeping keeping the uh, aircraft safe from the uas threat they're very serious about it, but doing so, doing so in a domestic environment where you cannot fire a kinetic munition, you cannot fire a missile, you cannot make that runway unusable for an extended period of time, period of time is just not an option for them. Also, from an FAA perspective, the FAA and airports definitely have their own ecosystem that you have to integrate in, into. Into you don't want to approach FAA not understanding that. How are you going to interact with, let's say, the ASDX or their new sensor radar that they're that they're putting significant capital into, into developing or their existing radar, radar systems. What, what do they have in place at air, airports right now that you can't do? Can't do. If you execute a radio frequency based mitigation tactic, is it going to be precision? Or are you gonna try and jam the, jam the entire frequency? If so, uh, let me tell you, don't do that. Uh, don't approach them with that because right now today, UAS and their use, uses in the airport environment have, are increasing exponentially. Major airlines today are using them to conduct inspections over, over aircraft so they don't have to stage them to do those inspections, saving them, saving them money and enabling them to keep us in the air and quick turn these aircraft quicker and drive their costs down. Down, you are not going to jam the spectrum. No, 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 no. It must be a precision strike if you do that. Do that. Law enforcement also have unique requir requirements for, for counter UAS. In, in addition to just being effective and keeping, let's say the Super Bowl or a major sporting event, event or, or another, another venue safe, safe, let's say a, politi a political convention. convention. Will the system be able to collect, collect data that's gonna, gonna be sufficient for rules of evidence for prosecution? Those are just some of the unique requirements that domestic agencies have for dealing with the counter UAS problem. And all these people are gonna leverage what DOD does. I guarantee it, they're good taxpayers, they're smart program managers. I believe I've spoken with all, all of them. All of them, they wanna do what's right for the tax the taxpayer, but they have their unique requirements and they're going to make sure that their requirements are met when, met when they do, do go to town.
Command and control systems I've touched on briefly, briefly here. Here, when you think about counter UAS products and, D and DOD, D, there will be a common command and control system. DOD has said what those C C2 systems are going to be. There might be another one de develop. It's develop if you have some optimization techniques, some software improvements to those. Getting with the major prime prime or the or the or the government activity that is currently in charge of developing and maintaining those is the is the way to go there. There and there, you could have a better idea. And if you have a better idea, people in DOD want to talk with you. And so do I. Now I'm going to have another slide with no pictures. I think I've talked enough about counter UAS and the opportunities. Now, opportunities are great. How do you make the rubber meet the road here? How do you actually take your idea, take your minimum viable product and get that to the right people so you can start making some money or get some more money to develop your product further to make it more effective? I don't read slides aloud to anybody. It's insulting to people's intelligence and just a managerial tip from Benny Watson. Time is money. If you go to meetings where people are reading slides aloud to you, approach them about it. You're wasting your, you're wasting your investors money and your time and your time is, time is valuable. Approach them about it, recommend they send you read ahead and that way you don't have to be read aloud to and instead of having a read aloud session like any, any elementary school person could do, you can actually have a productive discussion worthy of, worthy of adults and your shareholders time. time. So that, that aside, Let's talk, let's talk about this. How do we engage with government? You see a few methods, methods here, and I'm gonna talk, talk about a few of them. The government realized long ago that small businesses don't only just have good ideas, they're, vitable, they're, they're vital to the country's economic health. And what they did was they placed statutory and regulatory requirements in place to ensure that small businesses have a role in government contracting. And, and believe me, they follow through on that promise, they really do. They've recently gone even further and established new organizations like some you see here. DIU is the Defense Innovation Unit. Naval X is doing great work with the, with the Navy, AFWorks, and several others to help take small business agility and innovation and bring it to bear on critical warfighting requirements to keep both us and our warfighters safe. If you're unfamiliar with any of the organizations or, or, uh, or things you see listed here, I highly recommend you use your friendly neighborhood internet browser. I'm a DuckDuckGo guy. Some people like Google. I don't care what it is, but you'll be able to find information on, on all of these. And if you're serious about getting the government to fund you directly, that's exactly what you're, what you're going to do. Everything in here is a possibility that you can and should explore as a small business if you want to do business with the government. Most major government activities are going to have a small business office. I was working on the small business side of the house from, for few years, made some decent money doing that, and I never found one of the small business offices to not be of value and engaging. What you can get out of them is contacts within their organization. Some of them have a long-range acquisition forecast they're happy to share with you, and on that forecast, sometimes you can even find what's called a small business set-aside opportunity that you might be key and, key and uh, cr critical to play a role in, and they really do. They do. The government has research and development opportunities. If you want to take your product and get some money for it, that are only available to small businesses. You see one of them listed here is CIBR, Small Business, Small Business Innovation Research Program. CIBR.gov, they've got a great website. If, you, if you're interested in government money to develop your product, I highly recommend going to that website. Website, they have a great tutorial section, section, and they're going to walk you through everything that you need to apply. Now, I mentioned the small business offices. You don't have to wait for that CIBR announcement to, come, announcement to come out. You can engage with government people people beforehand and maybe try and shape what you have into a CIBR requirement. Some, organiza some organizations submit CIBR requirements religiously and they do a good and thorough job. Others, not so much. There's a vetting pro process for, for government program offices to submit CIBR ideas. ideas. Can you shape your idea into that to where they basically Basically, when it comes out, you might look at that and say, hey, I wrote that. Uh, one of my former clients sure did. Uh, did. That's the way to go. On the CIBR, some states even have matching funds, and they list them on the website. Many large defense contractors actually actively seek CIBR awardees to, to work with them, with them and integrate what they develop under the CIBR into a larger system of systems. That's a common technique many large, large contractors do, and some even put them on their website. Right. On a large opportunity I'm currently working today, today it's well over, over a billion. Some of, the uh, some of the smalls, when I did my small business contracting plan, 
some plan. I use Cyber Awardees to help me make that and help me vet some of the companies and, appro and approach some of them. I guarantee it. One of the major things the defense industry has done to help make sure we can get small businesses in is uh, called other transaction authority. And every OTA a, that I believe is in, exist in existence, and I believe this is statutory, I'm, I'm not sure, I know not sure, but they have what's called a non-traditional defense contractor requirement. And if you're a large traditional defense contractor, you're welcome to bid a loan without one, but you have to pony up some of your own internal funds, funds to uh, execute. Now, I, don't, I can't speak for other companies, but uh, for me and for my boss, we're gonna bring the non-traditional defense contractor on board. And if they have a good idea, idea, we want to work with them, work with them. Now that doesn't mean we're gonna bring you on board and then give you no work. No, there has to be significant work share. Now, talk about the engaging the, the defense industry itself, then I wanna wrap up and take some questions. I can tell you, and I've mentioned this before, most contractors, and I, me definitely, I love to talk to small businesses because I like to win. And a lot of the things I'm going after and the opportunities require small business participation. We need you, we need, and we also have to like and trust you to bring you on board our capture team on large opportunities. Large companies like to buy companies, CACI definitely does, uh, all the other major prime, primes do, and some people start a company with the sole purpose of trying to get it bought. You know, hey, if you wanna make money, do it however you like. I believe most large businesses in the defense industry have a small business office, you can get in contact with us there. You can attend defense contractors. Engaging us is never a bad idea. Now, a couple things I wanna warn you about when engaging large defense contractors. Actors, large defense contractors tend to go after very, very large things. These large things, we don't do that on a six month or even a year cycle. We do that, we do that in a very rigorous, rigorous cycle. We put a lot of work and a lot of funding, funding into that. Into that. A multi-year cycle because of cash flow is possible for larger defense contractors. For small businesses, cash flow is key and critical. If you don't realize that, get a different mentor. It's key and critical. Cash flow and your cash flow statement. If your accountant is not spending time with you when you get when you get that, they're spending more time, more time on your on your assets and debits and you are your cash flow. I'm not saying fire them, but you might want to ask them if they could spend more time with you and, and make sure you understand where your cash flow is. It's key and critical for small business. It's key and critical for us too in the large world, but it's very key and critical for you. So when you engage us, don't come to us thinking, hey, I'm gonna, this engagement is gonna produce revenue for me in the 61 year time frame. It might, and believe me, if it's possible, we're gonna help you do that and try and, try and do that. But our focus is normally has a longer event horizon than small businesses. It's also, and I'm saying this from experience on the large side of the house, because we work on, on a lot of things that are in, in the out years, everybody, everybody in large business, business is definitely busy, busy and definitely keeps busy. Otherwise, we wouldn't be employed. Boy, if you want to engage with a large business, do not call them, call us every single day about an opportunity that is a year out. Definitely not two years out and definitely not three. Please don't do it weekly. It's not that we don't like you and don't want to talk with you, but we have to, we have to execute. Keep the frequency down and don't, don't be scared to ask, hey, am I calling too often? I recommend trying to touch base quarterly or semi-annually and then ask, hey, am I calling you too often? Often what's going on? We want to talk with you and we want to help you. We want you on our teams, teams but we, we also have a job, job to do. So please do not over-engage. Gage, Gage, another reason it's important to talk with us is we talk with all of our partners and partners and competitors at the other, ma other major defense contractors. Contractors, if, if you were to ask you, hey, Vinny, I'm thinking about going after this opportunity and BAE is the prime. I don't think CACI has a play here. What, do you know anybody there? I'd tell you. I'd give you an introduction and I guarantee you any of my, any of my co uh, competitors would do the same. And do we compete with BAE? Absolutely. Do they, do they actually work with us and are we teaming? Absolutely. The same with Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, what, Raytheon and several other companies. We all team with one another. We partner with one another. Sometimes we'll take the lead. Sometimes they will. We know each other. And even though it's very competitive, all of us wants what's best for DOD. Now, I hope you took away something valuable, valuable from this. I think it's time to wrap up and take some questions. I want to say one more time. There is room in the counter UAS world for small business. I think there's a lot of room. I think you're gonna be critical to advancing it. I hope you've gotten something out of this lecture. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. And I'll give you my contact info here on this last slide if you want to touch base with me.
And again, remember, if I don't get back to you quickly, it's not because I don't like you. I will. <laughs> we, all, we all got jobs to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vinny. I think you did a really good job of explaining things because I don't see any questions in there. So I'm sure some will come about. So I'm glad that you put your contact information up there and you can contact myself or Purdue at Westgate here as well if you have any questions. Gosh, that was a, that was a very informative and, and even comical presentation, Vinny. So I appreciate that. It, it was entertaining too. So no, it, it was really good. I, I appreciate you being here. I, I appreciate CACI being an engaged partner within the tech park here. Uh, there's a lot of people on here that aren't from Indiana. So, so continue to watch out for us, look for opportunities. So, so we definitely have a lot here to offer. So I also wanna thank the Indiana Innovation Institute, IN3. They were sponsoring the April webinar series. So we wanna thank them for that. And then also it looks like, oh, Vinny or Aaron Pierce says, thank you for the presentation. So. Uh, I think we'll get a lot of that. And, and as a reminder, the copy of the presentation and the recording will be sent to all of you that have RSVP'd. So you'll probably get that later today. Um, for all of our webinars, either past or present, go on to the westgate-academy.com website and click on the events tab and you'll be able to see what we have coming up in future webinars, as well as you're able to listen to some of the past ones. So. Uh, we appreciate everybody for, for being part of this. Thank you, Vinny and CACI and IN3. So we look forward to, to more of these and hopefully we'll be able to see a lot of you in person in the near future. So thank you very much. Thank you, out here. Sure there's no questions? Means my college friends didn't dial in, good. <laughs> <laughs>